Welcome back, people. We're here with more Ace Attorney Chronicles. We're going to be picking up with our first case. Picking up again with our first case in Great Britain. Last time, if we revisit the court record, we realized that this dude, Bruce Fairplay, is one of the people who is in debt to our client, Magnus McGilded. There are a few other things to comment on, like this knife, which is the murder weapon most likely, and which probably does belong to our client, as it has an M on it and is fairly ornate. The defendant was wearing leather gloves at the time that he was captured, which had a large blood stain on them. However, both witnesses claim that they saw blood on both of his hands. If we take a look at the crime scene photograph, we can notice a few important details. Well, at least one important detail and one potentially important detail. Uh, potentially important, he's missing a button right there, which might just be a way of saying he's poor, but more likely than not is in fact the is in fact going to come up and if we look at the geometry over here we see something interesting when we compare it to the crime scene itself which is part of our evidence based on the blood stain it would seem that the individual was sitting here when he was murdered but this geometry doesn't match up it ma the geometry in the crime scene photo matches up with this meaning he was right here when the police looked at him welcome to the stream there Afghan. Also, it's pretty unlikely that the driver could actually see the events of the crime as he was sitting up here. But if the other two passengers were sitting back here, they would have had a clear view through this skylight. However, there is a latch on the outside of the skylight, meaning... It's possible that someone could have even climbed in through it, given the chance. I'm hopeful that during this section of the case, we can establish which individuals were where. Also, don't forget to notice this is the Phoenix Wright Omnibus. And there seems to be a dispute about, when, about how many times the man was stabbed. According to the autopsy, he was only stabbed once, but <coughs> the witnesses seem to be claiming he was stabbed twice. Oh. And we've got an armband that doesn't quite fit us, with Cosima's name on the inside. Um... Other things that are important to bring up, uh, if we don't get the not guilty verdict, we will be sent back to Japan. This guy is clearly Irish, but I can't do an Irish accent, so he has become Italian. The victim is a poor brickmaker who was in debt to Mr. McGilded. We've determined that Baron Von Zeeks is in fact a vampire, and so I'm doing my best Transylvanian accent. Try not to judge me too hard on it. And we have our three witnesses who have been taking the stand. Beppo, Bruce Fairplay, and Lady First. 
that's where we left off. Let's pick it back up. There was blood on both hands of the assailant. I sincerely and distinctly remember that. However, I suppose you might say that I didn't see the exact moment the stabbing transpired, if that matters. I remember seeing the knife, and I remember seeing both of the attacker's hands with blood on them. I didn't actually see anything myself, no, not until I heard that scream. Anyway, the fact remains, there can't have been anyone else inside that carriage, or we all would have seen it. Well, lo and behold, in truth of fact, not one of you witness was witness to the crucial moment the crime was perpetrated. I apologize, my lord, but, but honestly, uh, there was no one else inside that carriage, and the man's hands were covered in blood. That much incriminating evidence is tantamount to saying we saw the man do it. Now please only testify to what you actually saw. It's not really what testimony is about. Let us examine the interior of the omnibus once more. The victim's fresh blood is clearly visible on the seat, corroborating the witness's accounts. In other words, there is no substantial nor significant change in the facts of the case. Very well. Your cross-examination, please, counsel. Yes, my lord. Witnesses really saw. Okay, now, in true fashion, I'm going to jump ahead to the last comment because I think this is where we can finally start working our counter defense Hold it! and everything you saw of the incident was through the skylight on the roof of the omnibus that's right. It was fiercely cold that night, but the glass wasn't frosted over. Oh yes, I remember shivering. It was so bitter. Which rather begs the question of why the pair of you were sitting on the roof deck in the first place. Well, I don't know about this young fellow, but I couldn't enter the cabin. Oh, why not? It was locked from the inside. I tried knocking, but no one opened the door. It was locked? That's right, and it's a public bus service, for pity's sake. That's not what I call fair play. Yes, I had exactly the same experience. I tried knocking, but the gent inside just gestured at me to clear off. So I had no choice but to climb up to the roof deck and look down longingly into the warm cabin below. Well, I can assure you, I wasn't just looking down, I was glaring long and hard. And that's precisely why I can tell you with absolute confidence that if there was anything anyone else at all in the cabin, I would have noticed. Unequivocal, I would say. I'm not sure about these two witnesses. Could they really have seen everything inside the cabin through the skylight? They might not have been able to. Allow me to confirm one thing, Mr. Fairplay. You were riding this omnibus and witnessed events in the cabin through the skylight on the floor in the floor of the upper deck, is that right? That's right, yes. 
In that case, there is a portion of the cabin interior that would have been out of sight from me. By golly, really? Obviously, at this stage, we can't say for sure. But the possibility cannot be denied that at the time of the incident, there could have been another passenger in the enclosed cabin of the Omnibus. Enough hypothetical meandering, many ponies, friend. The prosecution demands that you substantiate your claims. After all, the scene of the crime is here, in the flesh. Very well, I will uphold the prosecution's demand. You will identify the area on this cross-sectional plan of the Omnibus. Where exactly in the Omnibus are you suggesting this extra passenger, this potential extra passenger, could have been situated? Right here. Both row rows of seats on the roof face in the direction of travel, whereas the seats in the enclosed cabin face each other. Which means... The visible part of the cabin which passengers on the roof deck can see through the skylight is as I've drawn here. Oh! That's right, my lord. As you can see, the seat opposite the one on which the victim and his attacker were sitting is obscured from view. In other words, if someone had been sitting on that seat... <coughs> It's quite possible that these witnesses would have been completely unaware of it. Objection. It's quite possible some phantom was sitting there. Uniponis have a forbidding habit of obscuring the truth with ambiguity. I concur with the prosecution's rejoinder. In a British law, evidence is paramount. I cannot entertain this conjecture, counsel. That is, unless you're able to put a name to this mysterious passenger to whom you allude. I don't think I can. I cannot. I mean, maybe the knife? Can you, Mr. Naruhoto? I'm going to... I honestly don't know. Who could it have been? Who could have been in the other seat which was out of sight from the witnesses on the roof deck? I'm going to save right here, because I think, if given the chance, I will present the knife. I have an inkling. I understand, my lord. The defense would like to put forward... Oh, crap. I have to put forward a name. You are a fool. So that response was a, was a desperate attempt by a man who has no notion of his own limitations. A toast to hard lessons not yet learned. Let us not delay, counsel. The defense is still to name the passenger in the other seat. This could be it. This could be the chance I've been waiting for to turn the trial in my favor. On that night, <coughs> on the night of the murder, the person occupying... Okay, I can't point to them then. Wait... Can I? No. I don't think I can do it yet. I don't think I've got the information. I have literally no idea. As a proud citizen of the Japanese Empire, you will look to the sky and walk up. This isn't just a case of going on, Miss Suzato. Hang on. I'm 
I mean, there's only one thing that I can think of here, which is that our client was the one sitting opposite them, and someone else was sitting next to the victim when he was stabbed. If our client was sitting right here, then the person would have stabbed the victim, waited for people to notice, and then in the scramble, they would have shifted... Hmm. This isn't just a case of going on, Miss Suzato. Alright then, I'll go on. The defense would like to put forward a name. You are a fool. That response was a desperate attempt by a man who has no notion of his own limitations. A toast to hard lessons not yet learned. Okay, I'm being required to put forth a name. On that night, on the night of the murder, the person occupying the seat in the omnibus cabin that was obscured from view, it has to be either the victim or our client. I'm just going to drop a save so that I can reload when I get it wrong. It could be both of them as well. I'm going to go with the victim. No, I'm going to go with Do our that. client. The passenger in the enclosed cabin that the witnesses on the roof deck failed to see has to have been Mr. Magnus McGilded. Mc Mr. M Mr. McGilded? What are you talking about, counsel? That's the name of the defendant. Oh, welcome to the stream, B. Okay, that was a cool move. <laughs> if I desecrate this chamber by smashing my hallowed chalice, who forgives a discourtesy? Lord Van Zix. People talk of those tiny island nations in the Far East as having le a learning and culture of their own. But I see they use the terms ill-advisedly. That's kind of racist. What are you trying to say? Let me explain in terms that even a student of an artless backwater such as yourself might understand. When the bloody scene unfolded, the victim and his assailant were sitting side by side. Multiple witnesses have attested to the fact is the very premise on which this case was built. But that premise may be wrong. What? If the victim really was sitting beside Mr. McGilded, it creates an inconsistency that can't be reconciled in any way. What inconsistency, counsel? The defendant's gloves, my lord. Both witnesses made the same testimony. They claimed that there was blood on both hands of the person sitting next to the victim. Objection. Yet we know the truth to be otherwise. Only one glove bears the gory remains. And I assure you, I did not lick the other one clean. Objection. The point is... Even in the face of this irrefutable evidence, both witnesses have maintained their stance. Yes, yeah, so their testimony remains unchanged. Exactly. They both adamantly swear that they clearly remember seeing blood on both hands of the assailant. In short, their memory of the events is correct, and their testimony reveals the truth. 
It was somebody else sitting beside the victim that night, a third party we have yet to identify. And the victim's blood was on that passenger's hands. Objection. Both of them. And who was this? This third party. Obviously, the true culprit. Yeah, we say that because we have no name to put to this person. Extraordinary. Horror, horror, horror. What exactly are you postulating? The defense's postulation is just that. Nothing more than conjecture. The witnesses have clearly stated that they saw the accused. But when elaborating on his testimony, Mr. Fairplay said the two of them were wearing hats, and I couldn't exactly make out their faces. Hmm, yes. The tops of their heads were obscured by the roof. I can see the rest of them, though. Yes, that's right. Both gents were, were, were most certainly hatted. Hatters do tend to notice such things, sir. And what particular styles of hat did the two gentlemen sport, Mr. First? I'm afraid I don't remember. And you call yourself a hatter. Oh, the judge loses his wig all the time, don't question it. The style of hat makes no difference. There was no third passenger in that cabin. How can you be sure? Because if there had been, the accused, Mr. McGilded, would undoubtedly have offered to depose the fact. Unless, that is, you are proposing an even more preposterous explanation. That the accused failed even to notice the presence of the true culprit in the very cabin which he traveled. He's right. If there was another person traveling in the enclosed cabin of the Omnibus, it's inconceivable that Mr. McGilded would have been unaware of it. Order! There is clearly a simple solution to this problem. Bring the accused Mr. McGilded to the stand. Well, what say you, counsel? The prosecution objects, my lord. On what grounds? As a suspect, he will, all, he will have already made a full statement to the police. But what if there's some reason why he's unable to speak freely? Magnus McGilded is no uneducated raffia. If it indeed turns out the man has been withholding information, you can be sure it will have been a most deliberate act. Counsel for the defense, what is your opinion? My lord, should we ask Mr. McGilded to testify? I believe we need to demand his testimony. Yes, we need to hear what he has to say in order to find out the truth. The defense would like to call Mr. McGilded to the stand. Hmm. In that case, I would like to hear the opinion of the jury. Ah, yes, um, I need a little time to consider this. If you ask me, I think we should hear what Mr. McGilded has to say. Get the man out here, I say. I'm kind of glad that that guy's knife is still stuck in the table. I feel safer for everyone in the courtroom with that being the case. It would be utterly illogical not to hear his testimony. When something needs doing, get it done. That's how I run things at the guild. Hearing what the patron of my favorite little park has to say, oh yes, that would be lovely. Yes, the jury says the man must be heard. The jury says the man must be heard. Very oh, well. The court will hear the defendant's testimony. Bailiff, show the defendant to the stand at once. 
we're going to have to prove why our defendant hid the identity of the other person. Or we're going to have to prove that uh, he missed something. Now, what maybe what actually happened that night will finally become clear. Let proceedings be resumed. Mr. McGilded, have you been listening to the discourse of the day? To be sure, I have, my lord. There are now two matters on which the court desires to hear from you. The first is whether or not there was a third party with you in the omnibus cabin, as proposed by the defense. The second is that if such a person was indeed present, why did you conceal that fact from the police? Again, no, it is not my nature to hide anything at all. Just answer the question, please. The truth of the matter is, I've been desperate about this all along. Do I tell you so or keep my mouth shut? Tell us what, Mr. McGilded? The fine fellow representing me is all is absolutely right. In the carriage on the night, if myself and the other man, there was another passenger. It's true? Hey, and it was me who helped the little urchin get away after it all happened. You... What? There was a kid in there? No, Magnus McGilded. That convenient excuse can't save you now. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, so, I'm truly sorry, so I am, Lord Van Ziegs. I'm sure you won't... You'll be wanting to know why I said nothing when we when I was taken by the police. I do be having a very good reason, I assure you. Which was? Well, the little child was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and not in any way involved, you see. Uh, he's a little baby Mario, you know. Didn't even have his Yoshi to carry him. What? If the police had known the wee woman was there, they'd have assumed she'd done it. They'd have hauled her into this here courtroom like myself. I was only trying to spare her that. Young hearts and young minds are easily damaged, my lord. Hmm. And who was this young child of whom you speak? That I uh, don't know. You don't know? Hey, the, the wee thing just happened to be in the carriage that night. I never saw her before or since. We have... We have absolutely, absolutely no reason to believe this man. The prosecution calls for the witness's statement to be disregarded by the court. I mean, you have no real reason to disbelieve the man, too, because, if you notice, this doesn't really give him an alibi. It means a hypothetical extra witness at most. Because I'm pretty sure we're not going to be accusing a child of murder. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the urchin isn't here in this courtroom as we speak, listening to the proceedings. Bang. Ah, smoke. Ah, fire, there's a fire. Look, somebody's trying to get away. Oh, after them. <coughs> I can't see anything for all the smoke. What is going What's going on? Be careful, Mr. Naruhoto. Cover your face. Bailiff. Well, if don't let the accused escape, secure the omnibus. I hereby call an emergency recess. Well, if ensure the defendant is in custody and clear the courtroom. We were hurriedly removed from the smoke-filled courtroom by the bailiff. 
amid scenes of chaos as people stumbled over one another in their desperation to flee the chamber. We had no idea what was happening. All we knew was that for the time being, at least, the trial was suspended. I wonder if there are any trials longer than three days in this game. Because, <laughs> obviously, that was a hard limit in... The Phoenix Wright games. Our client hasn't made a break for it or anything, has he? Because that would be frickin' annoying. Eighteenth February, twelve fifty two PM, the old Bailey defendant's antechamber. <sighs> Sorry, I slept in today and I'm still only moderately awake. What on earth just happened in there? Mr. Naruhoto, I've managed to find out. Miss Suzuto. I was told it was an advanced form of smoke grenade, a type of exploding device that releases smoke. A smoke grenade? It sounds like the sort of thing ninjas use. Oh great, they're gonna blame me, the Canadian-Japanese person. They're just making sure everything is safe now. I think the trial will start again before long. But who would have done something like that? Police managed to catch someone who was trying to flee the courtroom, apparently. Flee the courtroom? Why? Well, it's a young girl of around 15, I hear. Oh. Okay, here I was thinking it was a, like, a full-blown child, like someone eight years old or something. <clears throat> and... Okay, a 15-year-old, sure. We've already had one 15-year-old who killed someone in this game, so why not? A young girl? Then could it be the other passenger that Mr. McGilded was just talking about? But why did she have a smoke grenade? <laughs> Is she a ninja? My thoughts exactly. So he wasn't lying. Oh, what's become of Mr. McGilded, actually? There are so many things I need to ask him about, but he's not here. I think he was summoned to the prosecutor's antechamber to answer questions. Along with the young girl. Who is she, I wonder? And what was she even doing here at the trial? She was taking a huge, a huge risk, and for what possible benefit to herself? There's another matter that's troubling me. What's that? The 20 pence. Hmm? Oh, um... According to the coachman, Mr. Beppo, he took four passengers that night at a fare of five pence each. That comes to a total of twenty pence exactly, but now it seems there were in fact five passengers, which means the figures don't seem to add up again. She's right, that is strange. Counsel for the defense, kindly proceed into the courtroom. The trial will recommence in five minutes. Oh, thank you, officer. We'll go in straight away. Well, whoever she is, I imagine this young girl will be asked to take the stand and testify now. I really can't imagine what she's going to say, but it could alter the whole direction of the trial. We'll know soon enough, Miss Suzato. It's going to make things worse, at least at the start. In February, 1 p.m., the Old Bailey courtroom. So we were out there for about five, six minutes. <laughs> There's the young girl next to Miss, Mr. McGilded. Look, she must have been the one who caused the disturbance before. Okay, but why did she have a smoke bomb? Well, after that rather eventful recess, the court will now resume the trial of Mr. Magnus McGilded. Now then, Lord Van Zeeks. 
By law. I believe you have established the cause of the smoke which veiled proceedings earlier. It seems to have been an advanced form of smoke grenade, of the sort typically employed by the army. Good gracious, the army? What in the devil's name? It was an elaborate attempt by a young girl to cloak her escape from the public galley. gallery, but she was caught, and now occupies the stand. Your name, girl. Are you responsible for the smoke grenade which introduced such pandemonium here in my courtroom? What is the meaning of this deplorable behavior? Ahem, if I may, my lord. Yes, Mr. McGilded. I think perhaps I ought to explain here why it is that this the that this we, we lass here in is, was here in the first place, and why she tried to bolt like that. It is all tied up with the events of that night, so it is. Hmm. Very well, Mr. McGilded, give your testimony. You will explain to the court exactly how this young woman is involved in the case. Just what did happen that night? It's not like a defense lawyer needs that information or anything. Witness testimony. On the night in question, I took the back seat in the omnibus and promptly nodded off. Then Begora, a loud thud and a wee scream, awoke me up with a fair start. There was a fellow collapsed by me on the floor at my feet, so I sat him up on the seat across over me. Then I turned to find where the scream had come from, and bless my soul, what did I find? There was a child there, all curled up in a ball, hiding her wee self away. I remain somewhat baffled, I confess. But from what I gather on the night in question, this young girl was indeed riding in the omnibus. Is that correct? It is exactly as the defense counsel said. This last was uh, the fifth passenger, my lord. Is she associated with the cab company in some way? I'm just wondering based on her co on her outfit. Also, we don't have her in the court record yet. <sighs> Very well. The defense may now cross-examine the witnesses. Are you ready, counsel? Yes, my lord. Or rather, no. I have no idea where to start. The young girl. So this is an important piece of information, though. He is claiming that he took the back seat in the omnibus, so he's claiming that he was sitting... ...right here. I wonder, actually. Like, I'd like to assume that they checked this compartment. Wait. Wasn't there stuff in here before? Storage compartment, but there's nothing in here. It's totally empty. Judge almost lost. Something doesn't seem right here, but I can't put my finger on what it is. She used the smoke bomb to steal the stuff from under the chair. Oh my. Also, there's a new blood stain on the floor. This crime scene has, has been manipulated. Is something wrong? 
Oh, it's just, well, this bloodstain is so obvious, that's all. And yet Van Zeeks has made no mention of it. I suppose that does seem a little strange. Why do I have such a bad feeling about this? Yeah. There's some, there's some crazy cover-up going on here. There was stuff in here before, I remember that. And this bloodstain wasn't here before. Is it my imagination or do I have more camera control now? Because I swear I couldn't see straight up before. If I recall correctly, I was just barely getting this thing in frame to examine it. Nothing else seems to have changed. I swear this looks like it's still wet. But anyway, he was sitting on the back, across from the... across from where the victim was stabbed. And Begora allowed the thud and the V scream. Woke me up with a fair stop. There was a fellow collapsed on the floor collapsed on the floor at the me feet, so I sat him up on the seat across from me. Then I turned to find where the scream had come from, and bless my soul, what did I find? There was a little Mario there, all curled up in a ball, hiding her wee self away. Yeah, at this point I'm just trying to lean into his Italian identity. And when you first got onto the omnibus, were there any passengers already on board? There were not. The cabin was empty and there was no one on the roof of deck either. You were the first passenger, as it were. I see. Aye, and that's why I took the back seat side I did. It's the most comfortable, so it is. Could you explain exactly what you mean by the back seat? By all means, tis how you already described it earlier. I'm talking about the seat opposite the one in which the poor gentleman was, who was stabbed was sitting. Like I said, tis the most comfortable, comfortable and where I feel at most at ease. And of course, I enjoy gazing through the skylight from time to time as well. A loud thud woke him with a start. A loud thud, you say, and a scream. Aye, that's all right. How can I explain it? It was like the sound of someone falling to the ground. That sort of a noise. So you think it was the sound of Mr. Mason falling to the floor, having been stabbed? Well, now, you'll remember I was asleep at the time, so I wouldn't like to say... And when the sound awoke me, and I opened my eyes, there wasn't a soul to be seen in the carriage but the fellow on the floor. You didn't see anyone. But at the same moment, you did hear a scream. Ah, from the seats above you on the roof deck, I presume. Not above me, my lord. Throws from inside the cabin. But I wasn't altogether thinking about the screen. No, I was too stunned by the desperate sight before me eyes. Hold it! You sat him up? The victim, you mean? That I did, on the seat across from me, as, as I said. I could plainly see the poor devil was already gone, and you wouldn't leave a dead man just lying on the floor right now, would you? It is common courtesy, so it is. I find that a little hard to believe. Ah, uh, Lord Van Zeeks, now why would that be? You, you wake to find a man lying dead at your feet in the carriage. Any normal person would hail the cabman. Any upstanding member of London society, that is. Well now, as you know, I'm something of a special... 
I'm in something of a special line of business. The business of lending money at absorbent rates of interest? Unfortunately, my lord, not everyone is thankful for the help I offer them, and some would even see me dead. So I do try, where at all possible, to avoid getting myself in a tangle with trouble. Are, are you suggesting you were just going to leave the man there? Heaven's alive, no. I was always intending to report it, so I was. Only I had a mind to find out the whys and wherefores first. The whys and wherefores. The right you are, there were some details I wanted to understand before anyone else got to meddle. That we scream I heard, for example. Wouldn't your good self do just the same? Yes, the scream he says he heard at the same time as the thud of the victim collapsing. Then I turned to find where that scream had come from and bless my soul. Hold it! What did I find? Afraid I don't understand. I'm sure you told the court that there was no one else in the carriage except yourself and the victim. So I did, sir. So I did. As far as I could see, that is. What do you mean by that? No, no, it is a queer thing. The wee scream I heard as I woke up. It came from, if you'll excuse the vulgar expression, under me backside. Good gracious. Under your backside. Okay, that makes no sense, though. Like, part of what I'm trying to follow here... ...is how exactly the person hid in here... I'm trying to follow how exactly the person hid in here and got out. If he was seated over here. So that's what he keeps claiming, that he was seated on this side. But if that's the case, there's no way someone could have climbed into the compartment without waking him up. And when I lifted the seat on which I'd been sitting, I found that there was a wee cubbyhole there for storage. Mr. Narahoro, yeah. Okay, this is when they remind you to examine the bus and you're supposed to find that the cubby has been left empty and the blood has been added to the floor. This would be a very good time to have a thorough look around inside. And that's when I found her. There was a child, all curled up in a ball, hiding her wee self away. Oh, I meant to press that. So, Suzuto is clearly telepathic. Hold it! You say she was hiding herself. Hey, that's alright. It was a hard to see in the, damp, in the dim lamp light, but she was all curled up in a wee ball. When our eyes met, well, my heart nearly stopped beating in my chest. Really overacting this. Still, and all, I pulled her out from under there and sat her on the seat opposite so I could have a wee chinwag with her. The seat opposite. That's alright, just next to the dead gentleman right there. You sat this next 
you sat this young girl next to a court, sir. Well, as I'm sure I mentioned, a gentleman in my position can all too often find himself in mortal danger. So, I needed to find out just who this just who this urchin was, you say. And while I was in the middle of talking with her, I heard another scream, a fellow's voice this time. Presumably that scream was Mr. First, who was sitting on the roof deck seats. Right you are again, I would say, sir. Looking down through the skylight, you must have seen this young girl, and the gentleman with the knife in his belly. In other words, the previous witnesses did not, in fact, see you at all, Mr. McGilty. What they believed to be yourself and the victim was, in fact, this girl and the late Mr. Mason. Aye, my lord. I was, uh, as I think everyone understands now, sat at the back of the carriage, out of sight. It is certainly plausible the defendant is somewhat diminutive in stature, and readily confused perhaps with this young girl. After that, of course. With the scream from the gentleman over us, the driver realized that something was wrong and pulled up the horses. Thank you, I've heard enough. The events as explained are clear in my mind. However, at least one conundrum remains. At least two conundrums remain. Three. Wow, he came up with one that I wasn't thinking of. Who is the girl? How did she get into there? And how did she get away? <laughs> These are important questions to ask if we're to understand the situation. <laughs> Her name is Gina Lestrade, my lord. She's a chancer. She earns her crust among large crowds, relieving people of their purses. What's commonly called a... called a pickpocket. What? <laughs> this girl here, petty thief? Order, order, order. Is this true, Miss Lestrade? Miss Lestrade, you will answer the question. How does she still have that? She's already been questioned by the prosecution. How is she carrying a gun? How dare you? What is the meaning of this? Ah! The girl, she's gone! Open your... Open your eyes. I'm over here. I don't know what... I don't know what voice to do for her. I'm over here. What was the point in that little sidestep? I know what you lot are thinking. Grown-ups are all the same. This dirty little dipper, you'll say, slipped up and got caught on the job. She got herself backed into a corner, so she knifed the gin. Go on, that's what's in your heads, ain't it? No, not at all. This is a court of law. We're here to determine the truth, not cast... How many colors does she have in there? Look, knives are for cowards. Only thugs use weapons like that. All I need... For what I do is these fingers. You're carrying a gun. I'm a professional, all right. Maybe not in your eyes. But your prime, what I do. Yeah, she took that from Mr. McGilded. Let me guess. You don't count smoke guns among weapons for thugs. Oh, this... Yeah, this was in a bag I lifted the other day, down where they keep the four-wheeled drags. It's nice, isn't it? I like the pink best. Ah, do not wave that thing in my direction again. So, you admit that you were riding in the omnibus on the night in question. It is all right, alas. You can tell them the truth. 
You cannot tell them the truth. Alright, yeah. It's just like the Irishman said. He's Italian, actually. The court... Hang on. I read... Um, I only read the first part of that, and I was so certain he was about to say the court except this girl, Miss Gina Lestrade, as evidence. <laughs> I was so sure that's where that sentence was going for, like, half a second. <laughs> The court accepts this girl, Miss Gina Lestrade, as a valid and significant witness to this case. Accordingly, young lady, we will now hear your testimony, if you please. You will tell the court exactly what happened in the omnibus in the night in question. On the night in question. All right, if I have to. I can't do a feminine. I think it's a Cockney accent. I don't know the difference between local dialects and Great Britain, but... I can't pull off a feminine accent for her. I, I just don't know where to put the emphasis. What the girl saw. Let's drop a save. We've made some good progress here. So I snuck inside the carriage before they hooked up the horses, just like always. But it was a right old waste of time. I got nothing to show for me troubles last night, that night. I tell you, you can't see a blind thing in that hiding place. It's pitch black in there. Then, after a while, I heard this loud bang. Nearly jumped out me skin, I did. And the scream just came out. It's because of that old swell... It's because of that this old swell found me. He did help me get away, mind. Yes, he let you go. I fail to understand why you would let this street urchin go, Mr. McGilded. Oh, it is simplicity myself, itself, I'm a lot. You see, she couldn't possibly have killed the other passenger. I know that for a fact. As I'm sure I said before, sir. He was on the back seat. I was sitting right on top of the place where she was hiding herself. I think a demonstration is called for. This is where I was sat that night. And the cubbyhole of which you have spoken is underneath the seat, I presume. Hmm, yes. It does appear just large enough to, to accommodate someone of the girl's stature. Aye, but of course, the wee lass was stuck in there. Because I'd parked myself on th the seat for the duration. Well, so you, s so you see, that's why I let the lass bolt. I know that if the police found her there, they'd automatically assume she'd done it. But I couldn't live with myself if a young life was ruined, when all the time I knew she was innocent. Even though you must have realized your action would be called... Your action would result in your own innocence being called into question. Not at all, my lord, not at all. I knew in my own heart that I was innocent. So I thought it was worth taking a punt on my own good name for the sake of, a, of this less fortunate lass. My goodness. What a perfect gentleman. My lord. This, this, is a, this fine example of a man cannot possibly be guilty of a heinous crime like this. I'm ashamed of myself for ever doubting you, sir. Unfortunately, I'm not comfortable if this goes to not guilty. With calm, calculated reasoning, one arrives clearly at the truth every time. The prosecution is about to demand a summation examination, isn't it? 
Saints alive, all six members of the jury consensual in their leaning to a verdict of not guilty. This isn't where it ends. There's no chance. Mr. Naruhoto, this is... Well, it must mean... It must mean what? That we're victorious. We've won? Are you sure? Objection. What in the world? <laughs> if the sight of my... If the sight of my iron healed Wellington offends, pray do forgive the discourtesy. This really is a consummate example of the one monumental flaw in British judicial practices. Where evidence and reasoning should be paramount, emotion rules the day. Emotion. The witness's latest statement gives us a clear insight into his true nature. What do you mean, his true nature? Does you re do you really think Scotland Yard would have made such a glaring omission? After the incident, the omnibus was comprehensively searched by officers of the police. Obviously, the interior of this cubbyhole, as the witness put it, was included in their investigation. The compartment under the posterior seat was full of the coachman's belongings. It's noted in black and white here, in the police report. Good lord! The evidence has been tampered with. In order to corroborate Mr. McGillid's story, someone has unlawfully removed everything under the seat. Okay, that's what's going to cause things to be held up. Order, order, order. How could such a devious contrivance possibly have been affected, Council? Naturally, we must acknowledge the deficiencies of the constabulary in allowing this to have happened. However, I assure you, when the omnibus was wheeled into the courtroom this morning, the compartment under the seat was not empty. Well, my Nipponese friend... Hm, me? When the carriage was submitted as evidence, doubtless you examined it in fine detail, as would any self-respecting practitioner of the law. Pray, what did you find the condition of the underseat compartment to be? Oh, to be sure. The young gentleman will be able to clear this up in a jiffy. Sorry? Go ahead, you tell the court now, fella. How oh, this is all an elaborate excuse by the desperate Lord Van Ziegs. No. Nope. I'm going to tell the truth here. I'm also going to turn on the fan. Do you have something to say on this matter? How am I supposed to answer? What can I say about the state of that little compartment under the seat in the omnibus? It wasn't empty. I really don't know if giving this answer is helping my cause as a counsel for the defense, but as far as I remember, at least. When I first examined the compartment, I'm fairly certain there were a number of articles inside it, yes. Are you sure, counsel? Or uh, be whist? What are you saying now, you daft to da? I thought you were on my side here. I'm not interested in committing perjury. What game are you playing? Your task is to defend the man in the stand. Why would you say something? 
Why would you say something to compromise his position? As the advocate for the defense in this trial, I confess I'm still not entirely sure where I stand. But it seems to me that I should state what facts I do know as clearly and honestly as possible. Interesting. It is not altogether pleasing, fella. I'm simply telling the truth, Mr. McGilder. Well, don't forget that you're supposed to be representing my best interests here, lad. Now then. A fella's memory is a curious thing and not altogether reliable. No, the court must consider the facts. But the cubbyhole under a seat is as empty as the devil's heart, so it is. Do you think perhaps it would be in your best interest now to admit that you might have been a mistaken? Nope, the police report corroborates me. Why do I feel like something's not right here? Hmm. I should like the jury to weigh in on this matter, I think. That compartment is designed to house equipment used to maintain the smooth running of the carriage. The guild's rules state that omnibuses should be properly and fully equipped at all times, so it certainly wouldn't have been empty on the night in question. Beppo isn't that irresponsible. That money lending fleecer and pick purse are lying. I can't believe I was nearly taken in. The stinking rich are always stinkers, nothing but cowards the lot of them. And could you please get your knife stuck in the table again? It, I'm just not comfortable with you having access to it. What? Oh, no. It's a trick, of course it's a trick. Quite so, I must concur here. With calm, calculated reasoning, one arrives clearly at the truth every time. Yes, but every time a different truth, it seems. <laughs> My lord, I humbly exhibit the scales of justice. Clearly, a verdict that is not guilty at this time would be wholly inappropriate. Or evenly split. Thank you, counsel. But before we proceed any further, there is the matter of the, matter of the outstanding cross-examination. Counsel for the defense, begin your questioning of the witness, please. Yes, my lord. What just happened? The whole balance of the trial just shifted, almost beyond recognition. The Reaper of the Bailey is at work, it would seem. <sighs> what the girl saw. So I snuck inside the carriage before they hooked up the horses, just like always. So, you were already in the omnibus before it even set off on its run. Well, yeah, I mean, what's the point of spend... Well, yeah, I mean, what's the point of spending a joey to make a few bob? Hey, that's the wrong idea, isn't it? I have no idea what in the world she just said. Like, I can honestly say I, I'm not convinced that's English. Suppose she means there's she means there's no point in spent spending money to make money. It actually makes sense. Counsel, may I remind you that this girl is a petty thief. Kindly refrain from entertaining her tenants. Well, that does clear up the little mystery of the fares and all. Four paying passengers at five pence apiece, making the twenty to which the cabman testified. 
And one little escape race riding for free. The red conk of a drive always goes for some grub before his last run, see? So that's when I slip into the carriage and get myself hidden under the seat. Nice and easy, right? But your hiding place is a storage compartment full of equipment for a coach, no? Yeah, there's brushes and buckets and whatnot in there, sure. I always chuck all that out and cram it in a corner somewhere. No one ever seems to bother much. And yet, according to the, to the report filed by the police officer who first arrived on the scene, the compartment was full of such paraphernalia. was full of such paraphernalia. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Like I said, I moved all that stuff out so I could hide under the seat. That's all I can tell you. Hmm. Seems we've reached the end of that line of inquiry. Continue. Well, it was a right old waste of time. I got nothing to show for me troubles that night. A waste of time? Why is that? Well, most nights I'm on my own in the God Permit at least some of the time. Well, most nights I'm on my own in there, God Permit at least some of the time. I beg your pardon. Did you say God Permit? Oh yeah, well that's my, what I can't call it. You'd say the Omnibus, I suppose. Point is, on any normal run, the carriage ain't got no one in it for a while. And that's when you come out of your hiding place and get away? That's it. Only that night. This cover was sat on my seat from the start. And he didn't budge the whole way, did he? Not one inch. I was totally stuck. You mean to tell us that you were in the present in the carriage for the year, for the duration? You were under the seat the entire time whilst events unfolded in the enclosed cabin. Yeah, right, mister. To be sure, to be sure. It was as shocked as anyone. You don't expect to lift the cushion you've been sat on and find a child now, do you? Not unless you've just given birth. Obviously, that's a joke. So this Miss Lestrade couldn't possibly be the culprit, then. I'll tell you, I can't see a blind thing in that iron place. It's pitch black in there. So you couldn't see out into the cabin at all. Not a job. Most days, I push the cut cushion up with me head and look out the crack. And then I can't have a butcher's hat then I can have a butcher's hat and at who I'm going to fiddle. I thought you were a pickpocket, not a butcher. I mean I can have a look. The seat I get under ain't as plush as the other one, see? So most of the time the passengers plant themselves opposite. But for some reason that night this year Irishman spent the whole journey right over me head. And for that reason, you weren't able to push the cushion up to peek out, I see. So you can't even prove that it was him that was sat on top of you. The truth is, I ain't too happy in small dark places. Feel too much like being thrown in the clean. Well, it's the only place to hide in them carriages, so it's obstinate's choice. Why doesn't she just stick to picking people's pockets in the open? I'd say there's some reason that she's not letting on, judging from her demeanor. So anyways, I was a bit scared, but I had to just stick it out under there. Nothing else for it. Yeah, so that part is pretty dang questionable. Then, after a while, I hear this loud bang. Nearly jumped out my skin, I did. And the scream just came out. When you say a loud bang, do you mean the noise of someone falling to the floor? Couldn't have, could have been, I suppose. I don't remember so well. Point is, it made me jump. And you let out a scream involuntarily? That's right. And then I felt the cushion over me head get lighter all of a sudden. Presumably when the defendant got up in order to help the victim, yes. Or not. 
It could equally have been the moment the accused stood in order to stab his victim, could it not? Well, girl, did you see what happened at that crucial moment? Yeah, I saw it. I pushed up the cushion and had a quick butcher's while I had the chance, didn't I? The Irishman was sitting up the bloke while had fallen on the floor and on the seat opposite. That matches Mr. McGilded's account, of course. But then, the fellow suddenly turns around and looks right at me. I sunk back down again, but it was too late by then. I should never have risked looking. It's because of that this swell found me. He did help me get away, man. And when Mr. McGilded discovered you, he pulled you out from your hiding place? I was scared stiff I was. He dragged me out and sat me down on the seat, no? <sighs> Next to the victim, Mr. Mason? Yeah, the bloke had a knife in his guts. He was still bleeding. Then the carriage lurched a bit and he ended up falling on me, onto me. Ugh, how awful. Both me and it, both me hands got covered in blood. It made me feel sick as a dog. Both her hands covered in blood. That must have been what the rooftop passengers saw. After all, after that, I believe you talked with Mr. Gilded for a while. Is that correct? He asked me some stuff. Wanted you to know me name and what I was up to in that. Then I heard something from above. Someone screamed. Yes, Mr. First on the roof deck, one would presume. Well, I didn't know him, want no one seeing my f me face, so I didn't look up. Then the horses were drawn up smartish, and this year Irishman says to me, Get back under the seat. I'll see that you can get away later. Hmm. <laughs> All six members of the jury had decided the defendant was innocent for one brief shining moment, yes. It's clear that they are still very unsure. If we could just find some conclusive piece of evidence among this new testimony, I'm sure we would clinch the verdict we want. Yes, I think you're right, and I have this niggling feeling that something's bothering me, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. Okay. We've pressed on everything. Based on what was discussed when we pressed. I can't... You can't see a blind thing in that hiding place. It's pitch black in there. So... Court record. save on this. I'm going to double check. I'm probably missing something pretty obvious. This is how they found the guy, but I don't think this is the time to present yet that they found him in the wrong seat. Gloves probably don't come into this part either.
by flood. Okay, hang on. I want to double check pressing on this. happened before? I don't remember him reacting the last time. Anyway, Excuse obviously me. we were supposed to pursue here. Is something wrong, Mr. McGilded? Oh, I do apologize. Was there something the matter, Council? I'm just wondering if Miss Lestrade's last comment made something occur to you, perhaps. You seem to be thinking something to yourself. Oh, no, no, it wasn't nothing important. I was feeling bad for the poor lass is all. I remember feeling desperate myself as a young lad, shut up in the dark. Terrifying, so it was terrifying, so it was. I see, yes, I'm sure we can all sympathize. I'm still scared of the dark now. Aye, and I don't know about yourself, but... I find that the darkness seems to make everything you hear seem much louder as it were. Yeah. I, s I suppose it does, maybe. Miss Lestrade, did you hear something that night? Anything? An unusual noise, perhaps? Nah, not really. All I could hear was the Irishman snoring. The jabbers. The jabbers. There's no need to tell the whole world of me foibles, the little scam. What a pity. If only Miss Lestrade had heard something, it might have given us a vital new clue. Yes. Should we make that last statement as her of hers? Let's say it's profoundly important. My lord, I believe that statement just made by the witness is profoundly important. Profoundly important, but all she said was that she heard nothing. Yes, which is the profoundly important point. I'm almost sure of it. Hmm. I'm almost sure that I don't understand the inner workings of your Eastern Mind Council. Nevertheless... Miss Gina Lestrade, will you supplement your formal testimony by repeating that last statement, please? What? Supplement? What are you on about? Don't give me all your fancy talk. I know what you're trying to do, but it won't work on me. That's right, insult the judge. Always a good move. <laughs> I was straining me ears to work out what was going on, but all I could hear was snoring. So you were straining to hear what was happening the entire time, since the moment you hid yourself? Um, not exactly, no. Sorry? Well, there was no one in the cabin to start with. I could just push the cutting up and cushion up and have a butcher's to see what was what. But then, 
when I saw this swell getting on, it got me head down. I got me head down so he didn't notice me. And Mr. McGilded, McGilded sat on the seat under which you were hiding, correct? Yeah. Would you Adam and Eva, eh? What a mug. So then all I could do was listen. I was waiting to jump out of there as soon as I had him leave, see? But Woody, but Woody, not likely. Even though he stopped you in there, I never heard the door open. So I just had to stay put and listen to him driving his pigs to market, snoring like an old dog he was. The door never opened. Hmm. Are there any conclusions we can draw from that? We, I wonder. It doesn't add up. Miss Lestrade, what you have just told the court is clearly at odds with the facts. Ah, at odds? Uh, are you sure, man? Absolutely. It seems my learned Nikonese friend is not as dull-witted as I feared. So Van Zeeks realized it too. Counsel. I must insist that you bolster your claim with evidence, or some complicit party's name at the very least. Yes, my lord. I expect you to demonstrate this alleged contradiction to the court. You know what? We'll wait uh, another moment to save until we're on the presenting screen. According to Miss Lestrade, while she was hiding in the omnibus that night, she heard nothing but the sound of Mr. McGilded snoring. But think, Ryunosuke, think. There's something else she should have heard. It's a person. Very well, my lord, allow me to elaborate. On a particular sound that Miss Lestrade could not have failed to hear on the night in question. Sound very clearly explained by the presence of the following person. Take that! Thrice fired Mason? Yes, my lord, the sound that Miss Lestrade cannot have failed to hear is that of the victim, Mr. Mason, boarding the omnibus. Order, order. Explain your reasoning, counsel. Miss Lestrade, allow me to confirm something. You claimed earlier that you were the first person on board the omnibus, is that correct? Yeah, of course I was. I got home while the driver was in the pub, didn't I? Didn't I? And the next person up to board the omnibus was Mr. McGilded. That I was. Not a soul was in the cabin when I climbed the board. At least, not in plain sight. So, you were, to all intents and purposes, alone in the enclosed cabin of the omnibus at that time. Did I not just say as much? I was a traveling with any I wasn't a traveling with anyone else, if that's what you mean. Yeah, I saw him get on, remember, through the crack under the seat cushion. He was on his own for sure. And from what we've heard, the carriage has made the carriage made a number of stops after that on its onward journey journey. During which time, did you not hear the door opening or closing at all? No, I never heard it. That's exactly what I was listening for, wasn't it? Waiting for this swell to leave. In which case, when and how did the victim end up in the carriage? Oh. We all know that the victim collapsed inside the closed cabin of the omnibus. Therefore, Miss Lestrade's statement about what she did or did not hear is at odds with the facts. Ugh. Yes, this petty thief's statement was clearly flawed. Lord Van Zeeks. Yes, he knew. He knew all too well that there was an inconsistency in Miss Lestrade's statement. Eh, 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 bleh, eh, eh. Blah, blah, blah. 
<laughs> it would seem words of thanks are in order for my landed friend. What are you talking about? You have demonstrated matters impeccably. <laughs> this witness and her colorful statements are entirely unreliable. Her words are convenient and truths and nothing more. He's dead right. How could the victim possibly not have boarded the omnibus? That makes no sense whatsoever. And this girl is a pickpocket, let's not forget that. Uh, she, she didn't even say anything. I didn't want to judge the dear mate just because she has some rather naughty ways, but I must say... I can't abide lies. And neither can I. Mr. Foreman, I didn't want to judge the girl just because she has some less than salubrious ways, but I must say, I cannot abide lies. <sighs> ah. Mr. Naruhoto, that's five jury members leaning towards guilty. Well, your consideration for others is refreshing, my Nipponese friend. To the considerable troubles you have spared me. Yes, very refreshing. Ah, what are you playing? What are you playing at? Have you forgotten who you're working for, you useless Easter Namadan? This is carnage, it's perfect! Drawer number two is the only one left. Mr. Naruhoto, the way this is going... I know, if we can't find some way to convince everyone of Mr. McGilded's innocence, the judge will rule, and we'll have lost. I very much wanted to believe the words of Lo one of London's most respected gentlemen, but those of us in service know we must accept hard truths. Hold it! We're going to demonstrate how he got into the bus. Yes, the witness's last statements seem to have revealed an inconsistency in her story, however... If we consider the possibility that her statement is in fact the truth, it may shed an entirely new light on this whole case. What are you saying? Counsel? I'm sorry, sir. Whatever do you mean? Counsel, I will not tolerate your attempting to prorogue my adjudication. Explain yourself at once. I have no idea what prorogue means either. When the, when the accused boarded the omnibus on the night in question, the victim was nowhere to be seen. Subsequently, the carriage door was not worth opening a single time, as testified by the witness in the stand. And yet the victim's body was found inside the carriage. If this petty thief's words are to be believed, how do you explain the victim's miraculous appearance inside the cabin of the omnibus? Wait a second... Okay, I think I'm getting something here. This is a tricky bit. So, real quick... The victim was found inside, but the door never opened. So the obvious answer is that he was dropped in, is that he came in through the skylight. <sighs> so, if he came in through the skylight, then what if he was actually murdered up top and pushed down in there? What if, for example, it was an attempt by 
say, Mr. Fairplay to frame the man inside. I'm just trying to think this through. Like, obviously, I'm not certain that it's Mr. Fairplay, but... Obviously, he could have been dropped in through the skylight. Already dead. Or he could have climbed in, perhaps in an attempt to kill Mr. McGilded himself. It's not entirely clear. But if we consider the possibility that he was murdered on top and then dropped in afterwards, that's a possi that's something to consider. I'm going to go with the explanation that there is another entrance. If the door wasn't opened even once, the only explanation is that the victim entered the enclosed cabin some other way. I wonder what in fantasy you would come up with in your blind panic. But behold, the omnibus is here for all to see. Only one side of the enclosed cabin is furnished with the door, the other has only windows. Fixed windows which one which cannot possibly open. In short, there is no entrance to the cabin other than the door. But there could be. There's one possibility you haven't considered. Oh really? Yes. One other way inside that isn't the door. Another opening, the use of which allowed the victim to appear inside the enclosed cabin. All right, Council. The defense will identify the location for the court. Here is the omnibus on which the incident occurred. Where on earth is this entrance by which you propose the victim entered the cabin? Take that! The answer is obvious. It can only have been the skylight. I say, the skylight. Objection! Your ludicrous proposal has me lost for words. However, Objection. the skylight may well be large enough for someone to pass to. So you claim. But do you have a shred of evidence to support your adult brain theory? Both Mr. McGilded and Miss Lestrade said the same in their testimonies. They each claimed to have heard a loud thud such as the noise made by someone falling to the floor. Yes, which has already been explained as the sound of the victim falling from his seat, having been assaulted with the dagger. Yes, it has, but... Would a man slipping from his seat onto the floor really have made such a loud noise as the witnesses described? A noise loud enough to cause Miss Lestrade to let out an involuntary cry, in fact. Good, good gracious. Perhaps, in fact, that was the moment the victim made his entrance into the cabin. No, let me rephrase that. The victim didn't enter the cabin as such. He fell into it. You're now suggesting that the victim fell from the skylight into the cabin. That's simply impossible. How can you be so sure? Because if the victim had fallen through the skylight, as you say, the passengers on the roof deck would have seen it happen. And yet, not one person made su mention of such events in their testimony. Well, yes, that's true, but... Why the humble fella make a wee comment here? Mr. McGilded? To be sure now, 
The two fellows who were sat on the roof testified before. Said nothing of the victim falling through the skylight. But it seems to me, my lord, that is not so much a case of them not saying, but uh... Hey. It is a case of them being unable to say. What? I think perhaps the two fellas do be having something of a compelling reason not to mention what happened. Would you not agree, fine ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Huh. Oh my goodness, surely not. Those two chaps on the roof? You mean the ones who stuck the knife in that man were... <sighs> Just what exactly are you insinuating here, you, you blitherer? You rotter, he said it, you rotter. What are you insinuating? Why are you galloping? This is a flaming outrage. I have a good mind to give you a blinker in a minute. He'll give you a shiner in a minute, he said, and so will I. Mr. Fairplay, you're effectively accusing me, a city gentleman and well-respected banker. And me, a, a very angry hatter. A mad hatter. Suggesting that someone like me could have stabbed that man in the guts. It's... it's... a disgrace. It's scandalous. It's... ah! Oh, I protest. I protest in the strongest possible terms. That's right. I protest too. About you, you rotten scoundrel. Order! 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 This is not the time, witnesses! I will not permit this wanton invasion of the sand. Return to the anteroom at once. But this is beyond reason, my lord. It's ah, outrageous. It's very hurtful, you know. My lord, if I may account, if I may comment. Go ahead, Lord Van Zeex. It was the defense that incited this outburst from the witnesses. My learned friend has seen fit to abandon our protocol and accuse the witnesses without proof. Accuse? I never intended to. It seems, young Nipponese, that your com command of English tongue is one thing. That's freaking rude. You propose it to the court that the victim fell through the skylight from the roof deck of the omnibus. That hypothesis cannot possibly stand without the rooftop passengers being aware of the events. You have branded these gentlemen liars. You have in intimated their criminal guilt. In our British courts of law, that is what is termed a baseless accusation. I know I was rash to put this idea forward without any actual evidence, but... You can't just dismiss it without a second thought. What are we wasting time for? Get them to testify! I thought there was something fishy about that hat from the moment I laid eyes on the fellow. We have to see this matter through now, one way or the other. If there's filth and rubbish in our midst, we must dispose of it at once. What's, what's happening, Mr. Narahoto? Spectators in the public gallery are in a complete frenzy. Mr. Fairplay and Mr. First. Um, my lord. You, you will take the stand again and make another formal testimony. In reference to the indictment brought by the defense. Um, yes, my lord. I didn't come here for this. There's no time to think this through. All I can do is keep pushing forward. <laughs> Refuting the accusation. We were the only two people up on that roof deck, dead or alive. I can swear to that. If anything happened that we were... 
where we were sitting don't sitting don't you think one or the other of us would have noticed in any case neither of us know the first thing about the victim we had no reason to kill the man the skylight was shut the entire time I tell you we couldn't possibly have opened it you're so sure the victim fell through the skylight where's your proof <laughs> Hmm, I must say that on listening to this testimony, it is somewhat hard to imagine. How either witnesses could have performed any malevolent act on this open rooftop deck without the other noticing forthwith. That's right, you see. We are innocent, I tell you. Although logically, of course, the, fall the argument falls down if the two of you were in collusion with one another. What? Eh? According to the investigation by Scotland Yard, the two witnesses share no common dealings. Well, I don't trust coppers any more than I trust the stinking rich. Something doesn't feel right here. The trial is going in our favor, really. So why do I feel so uneasy? Counsel for the defense, over to you. Your cross-examination, please. Oh, yes, my lord. Yeah, this is concerning, because, like... I'm, at this point, not beyond the conclusion that our client is guilty. And I would kind of prefer not to get a guilty man off. But... Okay, I'm going to get through this real quick so that I can fast tap through the statements. Ah, jeez, I'm trying to go back. I think this is the message to press on. Hold it. So, you had never met Mr. Thrice-Fired Mason before. Oh, Lume, no. Never, not once, never. He never met the man before, he said, never. And you, Mr. First, had no prior dealings with the victim either. That's right, sir. Adders don't have much to do with brickmakers, to be perfectly honest, sir. No, I imagine not. You see, how many different ways can I put this? Neither of us have the remotest connection to the gentlemen who were inside the cabin. Yeah, here's a thing. They probably both have connections to Mr. McGilder. Excuse me! Mr. McGilded? Yes, Counsel? What can I be doing for you? Did you... Did the witness's last statement give you pause for thought somehow? Not the remotest connection. Is that the right? No, I wonder. What are you insinuating now? Oh, Mr. Fairplay. It has been too long, so it has. Eh? If I'm not very much mistaken, I believe it is fast approaching for you, is it not? Your repayment did. I... I beg your pardon. You borrowed twenty guinea from me, sir. At... at an unconsider... at an unconscionable rate of interest, you tricked me, it's extortion. <sighs> well now, that is a touch of begr... begradery. Well now, that is a touch of begrudgery, is it not? The sort of begrudgery that might motivate a fellow to pass his crimes off on another. Ah. 
trouble is the Italian accent that I'm trying to do for Mr. McGillard. <laughs> And the Transylvanian accent that I'm trying to do for Lord Van Zeeks are kind of m melting together, shall we say. <laughs> and young Mr. Furs. Me, sir? What do you want with me, sir? You do be making hats for a living, don't you? Do you not? Let their top hats lighten on your head. That is that one of your own creations, it, is it? Oh, well, um... I'm still just an apprentice, you understand. I'm learning to find the perfect fit for whatever fine gent walks through the door. The perfect fit, is it? It is a very distinctive design, so it is. Many customers like it, I tell you. They like a distinctive touch. Customers, such as Thrice Fired Mason. Ooh, interesting. He does have a kind of peculiar hat shape. There was a photographic print of the victim submitted as evidence of fraud, my lord. Oh, ah, uh, this you mean. Let's take a closer look. It does seem to be a similar shape of the whole top portion flopping over. I can't help but thinking that the poor fellow's hat looks distinctly familiar, wouldn't you say? Oh. That's... that's one of my hats. Aye, that it is. So it would seem the brickmaker was a customer of yours. The sort of customer I'd wager you could have had a weak quarrel with over the distinctness of the goods. Uh, no sir. Absolutely not, sir. Well, there's really nothing more to add. It, would, uh, it wouldn't be alright to say that the two fellows here haven't the remotest connection to the victim, you see. One of them was in debt to the same person as the victim. One of them made a hat for the victim and might have argued with him because, well, frankly, he's not that good at making hats. You, you little weasel. Ah. He's better at this than I am. <laughs> Gosh, Mr. McGilded has certainly been thorough in his research, hasn't he? Please, don't let me little interruption hold up the court proceedings. Couldn't possibly have opened it. Hold it! Are you quite certain about that? The skylight was that the skylight was shut the entire time. I'm going to lose my block with you in a minute. He's going to lose his rag with you in a minute, that's what he said. Take a look for yourself, go on. You see, it's shut fast now, like it was on the night. There's an external latch. So it is, of course, the fellow the size of Mr. Mason could likely break through it still and all. What? Just looking at the size of the thing, you'd understand. Ah, now you hold on there a minute, sir. The size of the thing of the ting means nothing. Not on its own, let's consider the bigger picture here, shall we? Let's stop biting on our cane, shall we? Really, that is going to destroy his teeth. Um, I was riding the omnibus on another occasion when, um, well, I broke wind, loudly. I shocked myself with it, as it happens. This, this is an unexpected confession, Mr. This is an unexpected confession, Mr. First. Oh, I, I just mean to say that, well, um, the point is I tried to open the skylight, you see. But just my luck, I couldn't make it budge. The stench was terrible. Everyone was looking daggers at me. I went as red as, rogue, as rouge I did. Are you expecting me to sentence you? Oh, no sir, the point is, Skylight can't be opened. I tried and tried when I was inside that cabin of shame. Do you have something to say about that, Miss Lestrade? 
Miss Lestrade. It opens. It opens. Skylight. That uh, is what we were talking about, right? Could you please not shoot me? All in Skylight's open. Dead easy. More easily than you can load that weapon? That's a lie, I tell you. Otherwise, when I broke wind, I... I you can't do it from inside, you mug. Oh. Look, a few weeks ago I was up on roof deck of one of them drags. I had a great hole. I mean, I had purses coming out my ears. Miss Lestrade, this is not the forum for to be eulogizing on the subject of your criminal activities. Well, anyway, I had a bit of a scare. When I lifted the last bloke's purse, he got wise to me. All four of them surrounded me so I couldn't hop off the bus and leg it. So what I did was I used the skylight, opened the catch and jumped right through. Yeah, the catch for them skylights is on the top side. That's why you can't open them from the cabin. Honestly, it doesn't make much sense really. You should only be able to open them from the cabin. So the skylight opens from the roof deck? Bailiff. Climb up onto the roof of the omnibus at once and verify this witness's claims. Oh my hat. Oh my hat. See? Okay, but seriously, why is she allowed a smoke gun in the court? Order, order, order! So, it appears that this street girl's statement is quite true. I don't believe it. The skylight opens. And from the roof deck. Mr. Naruhoto. This could be the clue we've been looking for. Well, counsel for the defense, please continue with your cross-examination. Yes, my lord. So, the skylight opens. Perhaps I should investigate for myself. Alright, let's take another look at the carriage again. Skylight was fastened shut before, but now the catch has been undone, we should be able to open it. You can certainly see inside the carriage through this opening, that's for sure. Yes, and he's... and there's a lamp in the enclosed cabin. I'm sure the witnesses would have been able to see quite clearly. It's not good for us. Oh, but now we can look at it from inside. Ooh. That's blood. Yes, it does open very wide, doesn't it? Wide enough to kick someone like you through, certainly, Mr. Naro. <laughs> Why me? Why someone like me? <laughs> ah! What is it? Look, just here. Look at this. That's, without question, it's blood. Why would there be a blood stain there? Surely it can't be unrelated to the case, can it? There's a blood stain visible on the frame of the skylight when it's open. And that is the proof that we were looking for. On the night in question, the victim was fatally stabbed in the stomach, and immediately afterwards the victim's body was pushed through the skylight into the cabin below. Those are the facts, and the irrefutable proof remains clearly visible in the omnibus that stands before us today in this very courtroom. What? 
What? That's, that's utter humbug. Ah, you can't possibly have any evidence. No, you can't. No, you can't. I mean, we didn't do it, I tell you. It's impossible. Irrefutable. Irrefutable proof here in this courtroom. Counsel? My lord. I believe everyone would appreciate a little clarification here, hmm? Where exactly within the omnibus is the evidence to which you allude? You will point out what it is that proved the victim fell from the roof deck through the skylight. Got it! By Jupiter, is that blood? Ah. This blood stain proves two things. Firstly, when the incident occurred, the skylights of the skylight of the omnibus was open. What? And secondly, the victim was already bleeding when he fell through the opening. Oh my. And so it follows that Mr. McGilded, who was inside the enclosed cabin himself at the time, cannot possibly be guilty of this crime. No. Order, order, order! But, 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 but! But the blood could have sprayed up there. Do you know how blood works, sir? Most of the blood that leaves a body when you have a wound is exiting because the heart is pumping it out. Unless you're kill unless you're injured by, like, an explosion or a gunshot, there's unlikely to be a large splatter beyond the area where the injury took place. But the blood could have been could have sprayed up there when the fellow was stabbed inside the cabin, and only found its way to that one particular spot on the and only found its way to that one particular spot on the skylight. Sure, and that would be very convenient. Ah. Oh. And let's uh, keep in mind that the skylight catch can only be unfastened from the roof deck. I myself wouldn't have been able to open it now, would I? But, 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 there's no way to know for certain, is there? If the gent really fell through the skylight, I mean. Why don't you have a good look at the floor that... Um, no, that, that's planted evidence. It is all too plain, if you see. That's the aftermath that shows the poor fellow drop it from a fair height, so it is. What? No. But, but it can't be. It's all... Lies! Hold it! My fellow jury members. My fellow jury members, I think we can all agree that this is, the, that this is clear proof of the defendant's innocence, can't we? I believe we can, yes. It's clear to me now where the filthy rubbish can be found in this courtroom. So they thought they could pull the wool over my eyes, did they? I won't tolerate any of the guild's carriages being sullied with blood. I won't tolerate it. Oh, I always knew that nice gentleman who gave us that delightful park couldn't have done such a thing. On three, then, everyone. One, two... Three. Objection! Yeah. That blood on the floor is planted evidence, and it did need to be called out. A chilling performance, Mr. McGill did. Oh, and what would you be referring to there, Lord Van Zeeks? A blood stain, stain on the frame of the skylight. Such evidence is null and void. Such evidence is null and void. What? Why? For one extremely simple... For one, ex, for one extremely simple reason. That smear of blood never exists. Objection. What are you talking about? It's there for all to see. And it's clearly blood. Objection! 
I personally attended Scotland Yard's investigation of the omnibus. The officers involved went over the, the, the carriage with a fine tooth comb. So I can state with absolute certainty. No such smear of blood existed in the carriage, at least not until this trial began. But... Are you suggesting, Lord Van Zeeks, that this stain of blood was... Fabricated, my lord? Yes. And while this court has been in session... What? Now that's... Probably true. At the very least, the one on the floor was. What a pavle... Pavle... I must say, I didn't expect such cruel reasoning from a prosecutor of your standing, Lord Van Zeeks. Wow, but I am a Magnus McGilded, a fellow known all over the capital for his co fine contributions to a public life. I don't take kindly to slander, nor fight it to the bitter end. Even if it's rolling off the tongue of the Reaper of, ba of the Bailey. Mr. M Mr. McGilded, I realize that this is your first appearance in court as the accused. However... I am well aware of your involvement behind the scenes in the great many affairs of dubious nature. You are very adept. You are very adept when it comes to avoiding getting your own hands dirty. And each time that it happens that the case you are involved in is investigated, you adapt the, f the facts. Adapt the facts? What does that even mean? When you feel the fortune, the size of Mr. McGilded's, however ill-gotten it may be, nothing is impossible. Tampering with, with evidence, manipulating the scene of a crime, bribing witnesses... I toast your ability to conceal... to concoct the most convenient of stories, sir. Tut tut, Lord, Lord Van Zeeks. This will not do, to be assured. Will it now, Council? Hmm? Oh, no. I think it's fair to say this does sound like a rather far-fetched excuse by a desperate man. The blood on the skylight... The blood on the skylight didn't exist, you say. But if you will all cast your minds back, is it not true that the omnibus has been in the courtroom the entire time? How could anyone have possibly put a smear of blood in it without the world and his wife seeing? Isn't that the right now? Isn't that the right now, Council? It's true, the omnibus has been full view the entire time that the court has been in session. My learned friend. Here's to hearing your opinion on this matter, in your own words. As you wish. Could someone have tampered with the omnibus during the trial? If you're asking me, I think it could have been possible. As a defense lawyer, it's my job to advocate for the defendant as best as I can. But still, I feel as though there's something even more important at stake here. There is no evidence to suggest that the defendant did as my learned friend suggests. However, in terms of having the opportunity to carry out the alleged tampering, there is one possibility. Good gracious! Explain yourself, Council. Yes, there is. It seems my learned Nipponese friend has no intention of running from this deceit. Deceit? I'm sure everyone still remembers clearly the recess that we were forced to take. As a result of the smoke grenade fired by the witness currently in the stand, Miss Jean Lestrade.
What is going on? Be careful, Mr. Naruhodo. Cover your face. Bailiff. Bailiff, do not let the accused escape. Security omnibus. I hereby call an emergency recess. Bailiff, ensure that offendant is in custody and clear the court. The courtroom was filled with smoke, and everyone was thrown into confusion. All of us were made to leave this chamber. In that brief interval, under the veil of smoke and in all ca the chaos, it could have been possible to steal inside the omnibus. Are you... are you wise? What are you trying to pull, you... you rotten feckless gouger? Feckless gouger. <laughs> you are supposed to be uh, defending me. Tis a wicked plot. Tis a plot to undermine me, so it Objection. is. Whatever you think this is, it changes nothing. The facts are uh, the same. After this courtroom was evacuated earlier as a result of the smoke grenade, a number of inconsistencies materialized in the relation to the omnibus. Inconsistencies such as... To start with, the storage compartment under the rear passenger seat. When the police investigated the omnibus, this compartment was full of the driver's, I the driver's items. Secondly, we have the smear of blood on the edge of the skylight. As I have said, that was not present at the start of the trial this morning. Hmm. Unfortunately, Lord Van Zeeks, no one is able to corroborate your claims. That's true. When the omnibus was first wheeled out, both the storage compartment and the skylight were shut. Accordingly, I'm afraid to say we cannot establish with any certainty of this if this evidence is the result of tampering or not. Indeed, my lord, no doubt that it was not a single person who saw fit to verify such things. What do you think? Sorry? About the omnibus. Is there anything else unusual about the omnibus? There is. My lord. Yes, Council. There is one further inconsistency. Mark that surely could not have been present at the start of the trial. What? What in what in the devil's name are you going to say now? If if you dare betray me a little maggot, you'd better start watching your back. Silence. Silence, Miss G McGilty. The court awaits the defense's clarification. This trial keeps swinging one way and then the other. I have no idea what's the truth and what's deception. What I am supposed what am I supposed to believe here? I shall have to ask you to to elaborate, counsel. Where exactly is this alleged mark that you claim appeared at some point during the trial? pretty obvious. Got it. If we consider that the victim fell through the skylight onto the floor of the cabin, you would certainly expect to find signs of blood where he landed. But as far as I recall, this blood stain on the cabin floor was not there when the omnibus was first brought into the courtroom. Good lord! Yes, I do believe you're correct, counsel. Well said. Although, as advocate for the defense, one might say that was a very careless slip of the tongue. He's going to slap himself, isn't he? I believe that blood stain on the floor is a decisive piece of evidence. But if the question is whether that evidence is genuine or whether it was unlawfully fabricated by someone. Oh, welcome to the stream, last one. I feel compelled there's at least a possibility that the evidence is fake. 
Of course, if the man was dropped on his back... <sighs> this a trial. This a trial. Is it all? Is over, Mr. McGilded. I've done everything I can to possibly cooperate with the court, but it is all over now. But but you're the defendant. It is over, I tell you. Memory, recollection, what people think they saw, it is all nonsense. Facts are what counts, and the fact is the bloodstain is there, now. Ah, well. And over the course of this desperate trial, long and extremely drawn out, long and extremely drawn out it has been. That good for nothing Reaper of B the Bailey has failed to present any decisive evidence at all. I'm scandalized, so I am. I thought a better of Lord Van Zeeks. Well, my lord. I must concur with the defendant. The unaffirmed recollections of an individual cannot stand as evidence. At this moment in time, the, the peculiar bloodstain in question is very much in existence, and the absence of any credible method by which to prove its alleged previous non-existence. I regret to say that it would be improper for this trial to continue. Your, your lordship can't be serious. Lord Van Zeeks, what is your position? I don't suppose you've got like another photograph of the cabin. Like there's still one very important inconsistency and that's with where the person was in this photograph. Prosecution. The prosecution, my lord. Has no further witnesses or evidence to present. Very well. In that case, as I believe we have explored every possible avenue in this matter, I shall proceed to my adjudication. As a formality, I am of course obliged to confirm with the defense first. What formality? As things stand at the moment, it would seem that Mr. McGilded will be found not guilty. Yes. Which would mean we've won. Is that really the right outcome here? Is it really all right for the trial to come to an end now with all these unexplained inconsistencies? Counsel for the defense, your closing statement, please. Yes, my lord. The defense believes... Like, the thing is, if this was Phoenix, I know that he would assert that they can't come to a conclusion until... ...they can establish beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, I'm going to hit the defendant is innocent. I want to see what happens if I give this answer. I want to see how it turns around. As Mr. McGilded's legal representative. I can't breathe. The air in here is stifling. But I'm this man's defense lawyer. There's only one thing I can say in this situation. I believe the defendant, Magnus McGilded, to be innocent of all the allegations brought against him. Thank you, counsel. Here's you. Here's to you, my Nipponese friend. And the most abject closing I have yet to hear in a court of law. Order, order, order. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs>
Oh, it was a grand decision to appoint you as my lawyer. A grand decision. You've saved one of London's most influential gentlemen, fella. You should be proud of yourself. Here, have this for your troubles. Ah. Your job here is done, fella, and some fine work you've done, so you have. What do you mean? It is just as the right honourable gentleman so succinctly put it afore. The trial can't go on anymore. And your closing statement there was, how did he put it now? Nothing more than a formality. make of all this. Okay, so if it was nothing more than a formality, I am going to give the correct answer. Especially because I definitely want to see what the difference is between these two options. I am here in this courtroom today to advocate for the defense of my client, Mr. McGilded. However, at this moment in time, I cannot in all good conscience attest fully to the defendant's innocence. What are you saying, man? Without any question, there is no conclusive evidence to prove that the defendant is guilty. However, there is also no conclusive evidence to prove that he is innocent. Good, good gracious me. One moment. getting chilly in here. Sorry, <laughs> I needed to turn off the fan. In fact, hang on, we're going to pause here for just a moment. As I may have mentioned, I overslept a bit this morning, and um, as such, I've only had one meal today. Uh, I think my blood sugar might be a little low. I'm not diabetic or anything, so no, don't misunderstand me there, but I find that when it's been a while since I've eaten anything, there's not much in my stomach, I tend to kind of... It's a similar experience to a sugar crash. And I find I need to eat something or I get kind of shaky. Anyway, let's see. This is unprecedented behavior counsel. A defense, lawyer's, a defense lawyer calling the accused's innocence into question. Are you of sound mind? So yeah, let's just read along with this for a moment. You didn't expect such an exciting spectacle, but still, have this for your troubles. Your job here is done, fella. Fine work you've done, so you have.
Oh, I need to prove that there. Maybe I'll need to prove that there is still an inconsistency in the case that we have evidence for. Because obviously, if we take a look here, this crime scene photograph doesn't line up with the blood stain on the seat. What this might mean is that we have proof the uh, the scene was tampered with even before this point. Some fine work you some fine work you've done, so you have. What do you mean? It is just as the right honourable mentioned, so. It, Gentlemen, so succinctly put it afar, the trial cannot go on anymore. And your closing statement there was, how did he put it now? Nothing more than a formality. The evidence we've seen genuine, or was it fake? His lordship would be fuming. Any unsightly rubbish should be pros should be disposed of promptly, as I said. The stink and rich are also are always guilty of something, you mark my words. I feel terribly ashamed that I ever doubted that lovely man who gave us the lovely park. Now that proceedings have unfolded in this way, I am compelled to declare a premature end to this trial. Furthermore, the court must accept the defendant's plea. I thank you kindly, my lord. I hereby Pronounce the verdict of this court. But we still haven't determined if the blood stain in the omnibus is genuine or not. We don't know if these witnesses are telling the truth or a pack of lies. We have no idea about the truth. Lord Van Zeeks, my lord, the case made by the prosecution was flawed, plain and simple. If indeed the omnibus presented as evidence was tampered with, the prosecution is, fault, is at fault for allowing such a disgraceful perversion of justice to take place. My sincerest apologies, my lord. But wait. When we were evacuated from the courtroom, Lord Van Zeeks ordered the evidence to be secured. I'm afraid the prosecution cannot shun responsibility in this matter. That's so unfair. The culpability of the defendant has not at present time been established by this court. Consequently, 
The jury will not be required to proffer judgment. What? Well, Lord of Anzix, it's been a pleasure, so it has. And as for you, my dear fella, I couldn't have asked for a better defense. Do you mean to tell me this has all been a grand waste of time? Tis the law of the land, my good man. If you'd like it to pursue this matter further, you can always go ahead and try and change the law. Mag Magnus McGilded. Good grief, you've more to say to me, have you? Just one thing. Just the one thing, a warning. This is far from over. Well, uh, something to be looking forward to, then. <laughs> I hereby pronounce the defendant, Mr. Magnus McGilded. Not guilty. Why are there fireworks in the courtroom? That seems like a pretty dangerous thing. I can't believe it. This is an outrage. They should have examined the evidence more. What are you talking about? The man's been cleared. He's innocent. With the courtroom in pandemonium for the second time the day, that day, the judge delivered his verdict. My first ever trial in Great Britain came to an abrupt end, with the defendant being found not guilty, ostensibly a victory for us. February 5 14 p.m. The Old Bailey Defendant's Antechamber. That certainly was a long trial. Yes, it was. Your first ever trial on foreign soil and your first victory. It was a wonderful performance. My heartfelt congratulations. And to you, Miss Suzato, thank you for your assistance. I suppose we should be happy. The trouble is, we're still completely in the dark about what actually happened. Well, we didn't have enough time. But isn't it wrong? I mean, who was actually responsible for Mr. Mason's death? We don't even know that. The sole aim of the defense is to obtain a verdict that exonerates the defendant. You carried out your duty to perfection. Aye, hey, that you did, dear laddie. Hey, that you did. Mr. McGilded. Ah, that girl is with him too. Well, it seems the stories are true. Oh, what stories? About the six enormous fireworks they do be letting off when, the ver when there's a verdict of not guilty. I'm sure you must have seen them now. Spectacular, wouldn't you say? Yes, definitely. I've heard it was a sight to behold, and to be sure it was. And I view to thank, I suppose, for having an opportunity to see it. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not sure I really did anything. What on earth are you saying, fella? 
How did I walk out of there a uh, free man, then? I don't think it was so much thanks to me as down to your planning. You're a straight-talking fella, aren't you? I must say, you had me a stray in the head there once or twice. But you're young and headstrong. That is water under the bridge. Congratulations, Mr. McGilded, on having your name cleared. But nothing's resolved. There's only one thing that matters to me. Hey. They've all seen that I didn't do that odious and absolute deed. It is a grand, is it not? I suppose it is. Now the fine fellows of Scotland Yard can take matters in hand and sort out any wee details. They'll see it for what it is. They'll get it to the truth. I have absolute faith in them, so I have, after all. I do be providing a good number of their wages with all of the taxes I pay. It's not that funny. So then... As we agreed aforehand, one thousand guineas for your troubles, fella. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't possibly accept that much. Be wis, you're a humble people, are you, from the east? Well, if you insist. But have this, and still and all, you deserve a reward. Mr. Magna. Mr. Mag. Mr. Magnus McGilded. Everything is ready, sir. If you'd like to follow me into the courtroom. Into the courtroom? What's this, officer? It is sooner than I was led to believe. I hope it's not inconvenient, sir. There were some changes to the schedule. Well, I must have been making tracks now. It is time for the inspection. Sorry, what inspection? They're going to examine the omnibus again, so I'm told. I asked if I could be present for it myself. They're going to examine it again, now. Naturally, I'm under, I'm under no obligation to, to take part in any more of this matter now. But as an upstanding member of London society, I do be doing my best to help wherever I can. It is a gentleman's duty, so it is. So then, fare thee well. It was an absolute pleasure meeting you. Thank you for the hydrate, last one. I hope you have a whale of a time while you are studying here in Great Britain. And there he goes, a free man. Oh, I forgot she was here too. Please don't shoot me. Don't move. Whereas I want to say, get a move on. She really does take forever to load that thing. Miss Lestrade, would you mind putting that thing down? You're a grown up. Sorry? And I ate all grown ups. Ah, oh, there you are. Naughty, naughty, running off like that. Is this some kind of picnic? Who's this little girl now? And taking that with you as well. I was looking forward to the trial run of my experimental smoke grenade launcher. Ah. Oh, do you want to play? You won't beat me. Excuse me, but who are you? Oh, good day to you. I'm, well, the inventor, I suppose, of that machine. The inventor? Well, normal smoke grenades are so dull, don't you agree? White, white, and more white. If you have to be shrouded in smoke, it could be at least pre be a pretty color, I thought to myself. Do we have to be shrouded in smoke, though? At all? I just took my eyes off it for a moment whilst I was changing onto a different omnibus, and she pinched it. 
Luckily, I fitted it with a telegraphic beacon. A tele what's it? I have no idea what this girl is talking about. Anyway, you're coming with me now. Back to my laboratory. What? What for? To apologize, of course, silly, to my technician. What? You mean, say sorry? You must say sorry when you've done something wrong. Surely an adult has told you that before. An adult? I don't listen to no adults. Come along then, follow me. Fine, have it your way. Oh good, you see I knew you'd want to do the right thing in the end. I'm fairly sure what she wants is to not get shot by that massive gun of yours. We'll be leaving now then. Bye bye. I'm sorry for all the fuss. She was a lively one. <laughs> Well, do you think you ought, perchance we ought to be on our way now, too? Yes, you're right, but where to? Oh, we haven't had time to find a place to stay. No sooner th had we arrived in London than we had to rush here. All our traveling cases are still with the bailiff. I was originally planning to spend today in search of lodgings. but this late hour in the day, I'm afraid we may be out of luck. Don't worry, though, I have a plan. Worst comes to worst, I've heard of a lovely park where we could s No. Please tell me you're not thinking of McGilded Park. I know it may be a little chilly at this time of year, but our youthfulness will see us through. I'm not so sure about that. I think a midwinter London night will freeze a young person solid just as easily as an elderly one. Oh dear, that doesn't sound agreeable. <laughs> She's crying. <laughs> Now I'm starting to regret turning M Mr. McGilded down. That 1,000 guineas would have paid for a lovely warm room. Or mansion. And so, the trial to determine my worthiness for the study tour was over by the end of our first day in London. However, as we were soon to learn, there were more trying times ahead. Just as the Reaper of Bailey had warned, the case was far from over. What's going on? Get the fire brigade! Water! Bring water! Quick! What the? How did this happen? I don't know, sir. By the time I got here, it was already engulfed. No one was supposed to be allowed in here before we started investigating. <gasps> So I think we can be pretty confident that Mr. McGilded was guilty. Save your current progress. That's a really good place to call it. The Adventure of the Clouded Kokoro. Dang. So yeah, I think we can be pretty confident that he was guilty, but his tampering with evidence prevented the court from reaching a solid conclusion. And unfortunately, we gave him the opportunity to do so. I imagine that when it comes to like the final case or this or whatever, we'll find a way to get him thrown in jail for another crime. Because that seems like the only way this adventure, this game could really wrap up. But we'll have to see. We're not going to continue any further today because I'd like to get something to eat and because I overslept this morning I still need to do my grocery shopping for the week. So yeah, 
Um, in the meantime, thanks everyone for being here. This has been a heck of a case, and I'm curious to see where the next ones go. Um, I appreciate y'all. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for chatting and lurking as you did. And I hope to see you next time. Later, folks. Bye-bye.